podcast, our first one for 2022. In this episode, we introduce you to our friend, GT, who is now part of the podcast. He is as much passionate about radio as H and myself. In fact, between the three of us, he has had more opportunities to be on air than the two of us, for better or worse, I guess. He's a petty guy from Limpopo, but he's now based in Cape Town, working in Federal his Studies. Okay, this is an understatement. He's doing his PhD. Okay. This episode starts off by H jokingly warning him against dating the Koza woman or Koza daughters as our friends refer to them these days. They're in Cape Town. Or maybe H was not even joking. I don't know. This opens up an interesting conversation about the intertribal dating and marriage. H recently got married to a vendor lady and GT and I are convinced that it was a conscious decision by him to marry someone from his tribe. The conversation then quickly of ramps into how South African ladies are not impressed with the baby guys and the close relationships they maintain with their mothers, bomma as they call them, which GT tries to defend. The conversation then naturally progresses towards finding out how is our newly married friend H finding marriage. I think by now you're getting used to H. His answer is nothing like what you'll hear from the naked DJ on Ask Your Man. Let me just say, Mojola has never sounded this philosophical before. Thereafter, H provides a much needed segue into our first topic of the day, females in sports broadcasting. The topic comes after an episode of the Unclipped with Ted Gonzo that we watched on YouTube, where he sat down with the three queens of sports broadcasting in the country. This conversation takes different twists and turns including the discussion of the inclination by different genders towards different career fields, men and women relations, how our respective human experiences shape our outlook of life and other related topics. From this discussion about how evolutionary biology may have influenced the number of females who are interested in sports versus men, H then draws an analogy between the way evolution can influence the decision-making process of people and the failures of the NC government as a liberation movement and their complacency when the struggle was finally over. I know this kind of an analogy may sound like a bit of a stretch, but it worked somehow. He then closes off his argument with a rather half-empty glass conclusion, which he uses various claims to support. H's argument and what may seem to many like pessimism, are interwoven with the theories of the famous French political philosopher Franz Fanon around what he refers to as national consciousness. You can check out Audiobook Master's essay channel on YouTube where you can get to hear H expanding on this kind of ideas. And later in the recording, you will hear our conversation rudely interluded by the soundtrack. This was my best attempt at disguising the fact that H's power got cut mid-sentence due to load shading. I mean, in this country, you cannot make things like this up. Yes, I know, we do sometimes struggle for some really opportune segues in our conversations, but a power cut to transit us to talk about load shading is not my idea of a good segue. In any case, GT and myself is the opportunity to talk about ESCOM and load shading. GT makes an argument based on an accusation made recently by Julius Malema about the deliberate attempts by the ANC government to destroy ESCOM in order to be able to sell off the company to private ownership, which is an argument that is gaining some serious momentum in the country. Although I do not totally disagree with the possibility of this being the case, I challenge GT and many others who share these sentiments to consider whether the failures of the ANC may be purely due to their incompetence. Lastly, I did some fact-checking and research on some of the claims that were made during the episode, but I feel like they would make the introduction too long for my liking. So please be on the lookout for some kind of a supplementary episode to this one. But for now, enjoy episode 4. Bana 
Bahlalo was there about time. That's the first one. Yeah. <laughs> but then, even as men, even though there's three of us now on the call, we are not the same. Yeah. Sure, for sure. Mm. And on that, do you think then, across board, then, in terms of, like you say, the ladies in sport, do you think then, the, in broadcasting, the ladies are different? They, if without ladies, there would be a certain aspect of broadcasting that's missing, by virtue of them being ladies, or it's just a matter of, we're all different, anyone could be different anyway. I don't know if I'm making sense. Like, is it a, a factor of gender, or we are different anyway, then a gender thing shouldn't matter to start with, because everyone is bringing a different aspect anyway. Like, the whole conversation of diversity. And we just inherently diverse to begin with, that it shouldn't matter what your identity traits or your, uh, you know what I mean? Or what like you, you, think, you, know, you know what I mean? Like because they speak, like, they speak like, them being ladies, it works different when they are doing the broadcasting. Yes, of, co- of course, there are stereotypes. There are also the societal things about who should be doing sports, who's playing sports, and who sport is for. So obviously, they'll have a different as- different experience being in that industry. But is, don't you feel like sometimes it's overrated as to what they bring? I mean, when I watch uh, the broadcast, sports broadcasting whenever I do, which is not very often, I, I, I forget the gender of the person who's doing the, the broadcasting anyway, it's really like it really doesn't matter. Yeah, well, maybe there's that. Like you said, uh, marriage has got universal aspects. So I would say yeah. the two different genders would have things that are common for them. Specifically, for example, uh, there's this banter that I've seen with sports broadcasters that women don't usually bring on, like the competitive nature. So when I'm the broadcaster, let's say I'm I'm broadcasting on, on, on radio and the host supports a team that lost and I'm doing the sports news. I've seen the guys become more competitive around Pirates lost on Friday, yeah. the Champions League, because they are also in the sport. They're probably fans of the sport even before they are workers in the sport. So that you would find with a with a man most of the time. So it's not the same... So it's tough to generalize, like you're saying. We are diverse, but I think there's just certain things that you could peel out from the different gendered broadcasters that would be an element. For example, I doubt they played soccer at the level that a, a man, did, a would, man have. would have played. So there's an element of understanding there that might be slightly different. Uh, it's tough to break the women-men social relations as well. Even when you've got a Mpolit Solonyan in front of you as as a host or or in front of you. Those things still come, hey, she's pretty as a guy as you're watching. Hey, she's because that's the men women socialization, right? But, but then people start to have a and stuff, man. For oh, you just over sexualizing women. Why don't you do this why don't women do the same with men? Because because they they, they might as well, right? They could as well. When they sure. look at Robert Marawas, uh, don't see the podcast, but see this hot man, whatever. But they do it's in their own so, way. Uh-huh. They also do it in their own way. It won't be the same. But we 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 are together, man. Kiromuto uh, has a line which says, all problems that assail the human race emanate from the love mat. This is now a fought over niggas trying to get laid, bruh. Yeah, but it's mundane in the sense that that's all it is. Like mm. that's all it is. You get what I'm saying? It's not. It's not personality creating how you have it. You get what? I'm, it's just like in a lot or spam. Nobody cares about gender anymore. As much as okay, as much as there are those industries <laughs> where people do care about it. But I honestly don't think that we still see it as like a big thing that you know um, so and so is 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 a is, is a broadcaster within um, you know rugby field and as a woman you know people will will now be moved or women will now be moved to listen to her as you know she's bringing us the analysis of what's happening with the Springbok or any other, you know, tournament, super rugby of uh, games of some sort. So I, I honestly think that how good she is as a woman, I, I can give you my experience of 
you know, being hooked, let's say to uh, Carol Manana, Carol Chawalala, for instance. It wasn't because she's a woman that I started to watch her presenting analysis on, on SABC Sport. It was more of, you know, she was, she, she, she came in with, with a new charm altogether. So, but what do you think she was also a bit sexy? Uh, yeah, well, that's that's what a big sports yeah. fan, but <laughs> then Carol, huh? yeah, yeah, but King Honey, yeah, <laughs> yeah, of of course, how she talks as a woman, you know, you 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 get you like her, right? But yeah. at the very same time, it's it's just how brilliant she was in delivering her analysis and how she was oh, conducting sure, her yeah. interviews with our David Kekana and um, the, the the rest of the analysis team. So I would watch that, and obviously then it was still a wall Tamuko and during those times as well, and now David Keka, and you would you would you would you would you would sense that like no sharp as much as as much as Walter is great at what he's doing on the SABC sport and delivering this thing, Carol is also uh, you know an equal at this instance. Yeah. You know she's doing her job brilliantly, but it wasn't because no she's a woman. I would. Honestly, you know, give you another name. There was this girl, I don't know if ever she's still with a super sport, but uh, her name is Chacho Mweng. I don't know if you guys know her, but she's mm-hmm. a brilliant sports broadcaster. If ever there's anyone, you know, that I thought by now would be, you know, reigning, like, I don't know, you know, she's a top uh, sport broadcaster on SABC Sport or on Super Sport, I would have thought that it would be her. But it seems as if they... I don't know, they, they try to put them behind, they give them, you know, they don't give them much uh, time as we would wish they would have given them. Like how, you know, our Carol Chavalala, they would be there on a weekly basis. You would see her and you would enjoy her, or her doing uh, interviews after each and every game. So I don't think it's about gender, bro. Then there are people who, the, the women were marginalized in the past kind of arguments. Yeah. Um... How can I put this? Which which came up in that unclipped uh, episode with with Ted? Sure. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and this need to say, okay, because of that, and there are a lot of parallel arguments about all the other things, sexuality, race, where this kind of uh, argument comes in to say, because women are marginalized in the past, it's time to open up the industry for them, so to speak, to say, sure. okay, it's time we let more of them in. Uh, mm-hmm. It's time to. Uh, inspire that young girl who wants to get sure. into sports to to but there's also another element me personally if I was to respond to that question that I just asked myself yeah. an element of but to be honest man I don't think it's a social construct that mm-hmm. women are not as interested in sport as men are mm-hmm. because I don't know I think there is something at a at a genetic or evolutionary level about men that likes comp- that likes competitiveness I mean men evolved going to fighting wars while yeah. women were at home uh, taking care of the family. So there's always an element of, but it's true, that's how, that's how we evolved HR. You, you can't have it. It's a, it's a historic fact. In, in the past, in evolution, women were gatherers, men were hunters. Men would go out into the field, they'd, they'd be facing other tribes, fighting on behalf of, of the tribe and all that, and women were responsible for taking care But in the day and age, do you so, think it's, 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 we should be bringing up that argument? Uh, it's, it's, we, we adapted yeah. to it over time. I think we, we adapted to it. That, that's how the family structures evolved over time. And, and I don't know how it came about to be like that, but we, ad, we ended up adapting it to, adapting to be like that. The point I'm getting into is then men naturally became more competitive as compared to women. And sports, if there's anything that is a true definition of what competitiveness is sports, there is no sport without competition. And there's something that draws men about in, into that, especially in the times when you don't have to fight anymore. You can just sit home, drink your beer, and watch men sit all day long. You don't have to go out. And, you know, it's like they, what's the word? they embody this desire you have to be competitive. Your team is winning and stronger than the other team. So naturally, I believe it will always be the case that men are more interested in sports than women. And by virtue of that, I don't, they, they don't have to, I don't think women have to try and also be interested in sports. There are other things that are also interested in by, by virtue of evolving the way they have over time that, they've, that have drawn them more interested in them than men are interested in. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I think the, the, the forcing of women to also like sports because we want to equalize the equation. 
forcing women, because there's also a similar argument, by the way, with the things like engineering and all that, where they're trying to push girls in engineering, girls in science. Yes, there will be obviously a lot of ladies who are good at, at math and science who like engineering, but I think we are fighting a losing battle in here on, a, on that level. Ah, to say no, we're going to force um, girls uh, to love it. No, and I'm not saying, and I'm not saying, no, and I'm not no. saying women should be deprived of opportunities to enter into those things. But it should be a opportunity should be available for any woman who wants to enter into that industry. There should never be a ruler to stop a woman or not. But I think, forcing, I, think, I feel like I sometimes think, I think force, yeah. we have moved past that time. Uh, we have moved past that time of. Have you also moved past time of where women are only the ones that get pregnant? No, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, come on, if, you you cannot then now be bringing up that as an argument. No, you, you know, know what I'm you, That's well, nature. You know that. That's nature. So, 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 yes, yes, it's nature, right? That's and nature. Nature has, nature has those elements. No, yes. but you do is it, a woman. Is it not, are you trying to tell yes, me so, right now that a so, woman so, so. deciding to pursue engineering, deciding to pursue football as a career, it's nature or it's a career choice? Repeat your question. It's, are you trying to say now that people who are now, because now you're comparing uh, women getting pregnant with uh, a different thing altogether. We're talking about the fields that these women are doing or yeah. uh, that everybody's, you, you brought the past or what, what used to happen in the past, right? Which we accepted that this is what used to happen in the past. And we agree that women were deprived of these opportunities. Women were deprived of this and this yeah. and that, right? Yeah. Sure. Which we agree. And then now, um, we're talking, I, I'm like, no, let's move from that to current. Is this still the situation at this particular moment in time? You're still bringing it up to say that we are fighting a losing battle when it comes to, um, you know, it seems as if you're forcing women to, to get into this so-called male-dominated field. And I'm saying to you that we have moved past that time. At, at this said- yeah. Can, at can this I, moment can, in time, in, in, yes. in this day and age, we've moved past that time of questioning um, people taking particular careers, um, you know, thinking that, okay, no, it's male-dominated or we're forcing women into this. They are voluntarily coming in, into this, these professions and doing them voluntarily. There's, a, yes. there's no longer a first woman becoming an engineer in 2000. No. All of them, now there's a flood of engineers, there's a flood of mechanics, there's a flood of football, women football players, rugby players. I even actually heard in the past few weeks that there's, um, you know, um, a, a, a key tournament that's going to be taking place here for women in rugby. And I was so like, wow, man, this is, this is quite great if ever we are able to experience such now in this day and age. But when I say, compare, come, coming with, that analysis of saying that, you know, it's a losing battle when it comes to, you know, uh, women taking part in this type of careers, it's not going to work. No, I, I, okay. I honestly... Can I say this? Into the yeah, so I heard you, Mishan. And can I reiterate my point? I'm not saying women should not be allowed to go into sports. Can we get that? I'm not saying that. It's good that we are here now where if a woman wants to get into a career that was previously male-dominated, that they have an opportunity to do so, that no one is standing on their way. I'm all for that. <laughs> And that's the times we are in where everyone should be able to pursue whatever <laughs> makes them happy, right? I just interrupted me. Can can you speak before I make my point? H, what's uh, can you? Hey, so you can you can bring up your <laughs> and then he goes off like like what's happening? Because he's distracting me. Man. So sharp. So this is what I'm saying, GT. This mm-hmm. is what I'm saying. Mm. So yes. I'm not saying women should not be allowed to enter sport. It's good that any anyone can enter into a career that they wish. If as a man you want to become a nurse, that should be that should be that that's how it should be if that's something you desire for. And if a woman wants to want to become I don't know a race a track driver whatever they want to be, it's fine. My problem comes here ne, where the opportunities are, are, are available. I, I forgot what they call this. This uh, comparison, equality of outcome versus equality of opportunities. I believe there should be equality of opportunities. Everyone should be should never be deprived to enter into a career that they wish to enter into because of their agenda. That should never be the case. My problem comes with someone uh, going 
uh, Nsikima is going to get the stats of male broadcasters versus women broadcasters and say this is evidence of that the world is still oppressing women, they are not allowing women into sport. Meanwhile, there are other elements that go into it, such as women's interest into it. And my okay. argument say, I believe there are careers that men will naturally be inclined and interested in oh, yeah. by based on what I just explained. So the past I was talking about is not the past of 1632 past. No, I'm talking like millions and millions of our, of our evolution, of our ancestral species before yeah. us, where <clears throat> There's a certain by virtue of okay, let me let me say this. Is it not a biological fact that on a general level, men are physically stronger than women? I'm sure we can kind of agree. No, on we that. can all agree on that. Yeah. Of course, uh, I'm sure I can find hundred women that are stronger than you, but that's not on a general uh, uh, um, population okay. level, right? And by virtue of that, what Ish was saying earlier to say, women, for example, express menstruation every month. By virtue of experiencing that, there's something that comes with that experience that shapes them as a gender into a particular, in, in that adopts them into a particular type of uh, trade, so to speak. Women are the, uh, you thought my example with pregnancy was arbitrary and just, I was just saying it. By virtue of women being the ones who bear kids, as opposed to men, there's something that comes with that. There are some things that only women will ever be able to have intuition for. They'll ever have skills. They'll ever develop strengths for over men because they don't ever experience that. So on the same level, there are things of, like, of men being physically stronger than women that comes with that. You know what I mean? And those things translate themselves into when we develop careers, when industries develop. There are things that men, by virtue of having, having developed certain interests and strengths, that they, they are more inclined to be interested in. Like I was telling you guys about that study they did in, I think it was in Singapore, where Singapore is considered one of the most liberal and open-minded countries where anyone of any gender is allowed to do any career. It's one of those. And they, they found that exactly because of that, women were interested in careers where they get to deal with people more and men were more interested in cars where they have to deal with things, hence the example of engineering, where they have to do with mechanics and all that. And women are more interested in being teachers, psychologists, and so on and so forth, doctors, you know what I mean? And I can, I can believe that by virtue of the fact that women have been the ones over time and by virtue of the, the biological reality that they're the ones that bear kids and take care of kids for the most part, they, they, they've developed a, a nurturing instinct that is stronger than that of men. And as, as a result, they are more, they feel more in the natural environment when they're in an environment where they get to take care of people and help people, they deal with people rather than, rather than uh, things, yeah. So I'm not saying women should not be, I'm, I'm definitely not saying I that. I think I get your women point. Anyone who wants to do any career, we live in those times, and I'm glad we live in the times where yeah. uh, women can come and have a rugby tournament. I think that's a good thing that they're able to do that. Yeah. But whether or not it will be as good as a Springboks uh, tournament, I don't know. The ANC with their struggle, sort of like impact decisions they then take when they step into into government, as opposed to seeing it as more struggle. They saw, hey, repomoti, we are tired True. of yeah. anything, so now it's our time to eat. And as such, the corruption that you 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 will see in this country, I think, follows from from that assessment. And what I sent around. Uh, Franz Fanon's pitfalls of national consciousness. Essentially, yeah. he says, because you are constructed in this colonial world, yeah. you are in anticipation of getting into the levers of power, so that you can con- you can continue to do whatever the colonial powers were doing. So, if they were living in nice houses, and I think Julius Malema has said this before, he said that no, oh, us the struggle was so that we can live like white people, which is deeply problematic, right? But that is how it happens. Your, 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 your future will sort of like impact the traits you will carry out. And I think which is why I insist that their failures are inevitable. This is, there was nothing else you were going to expect here. These guys are doing what is expected of people who were, who were in their position, so to speak. So for us to get new outcomes, I think we're going to need sort of like a, a different brand of people almost. For me, but yeah, what do you mean by? Because my, my question was going to be, 
what would it have taken for the outcome to have been different? What would, what did it have to take? Or are you saying it was inevitable? Because we've spoken about this in the in the past. Is it is it something you can never run away from? Because um, so, sorry, let me just maybe use this as an example. When when, when was it when Mandela passed away? Was it 2013? 14? 13? No, it was. Yeah, it was 13. It was 13 December. 13 December 2013. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. yeah, and I remember. Yeah, we're still at vets, and I had he donated money. His foundation donated money or something to vets. And I thought, it must be millions. Man. This man donated 100,000 to VAIDS. Like, ah, man, that's one academic year. And I was shocked by how little money this man had. But it's with the power this man had, man, he could have accumulated so much wealth over time. I don't think he died a very rich man. Yes, he didn't die quite an artist, but he didn't die. He certainly didn't <laughs> die. <laughs> he certainly didn't die an open hymn, you know what I mean? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. How do Pato Artis die, bro? <laughs> um, no, uh, you know the struggle, I'm just... What would Papa Putsi do? That's the question. <laughs> uh, you know the struggle. <laughs> but he didn't die, he didn't die a, 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 an Oppenheimer or, or a Rothschild, you know what I mean? Despite the amount of power this man had. I mean, at, that, at this time, there was no man more powerful, man. I'd argue in the world, actually given like, political power, so to speak, can yeah. talk about all sort of other powers. No, you're, and he didn't you're, use it, you're to, right. he didn't use it to, to, to amass wealth over time. Why didn't he, if you say it's kind of, you can't help it, so to speak, that a, a, a generation immediately after colonialism would be that kind of a generation. Why didn't he become that guy? I think he was that guy. Just that it was a different kind, right? So... If you want to say an accumulation of wealth is, is a function of what the balance sheet says at the point of death, I think that would be uh, misrepresenting what it means to step into the divas of power without necessarily all the other muscles which are needed for you to actually hone in into this power. Because political power is one thing, right? But it doesn't operate by itself. It, does, it doesn't operate by itself. It operates with other mechanisms that ensure that you can do it. So there's no way, even in South Africa, you can talk about public sector corruption without talking about private sector corruption, right? Because they are the ones who are buying the public officials. They are the ones that are influencing the public officials to take decisions in their favor. So as president, as Mandela, as who is, what he has is what I would say is charismatic influence, right? Not necessarily the president who's going in to drink the man. I don't even think Zuma will die with the level of money we think he when has. he passes on, he will have. It's not so much about how you are accumulating, but the kind of decisions you will take because of this limited power that you have, whether it's economic, whether it's the factors of production, whether it's who you must ask for certain things to be able to be executed in your country. Yeah. Those are the questions that when you are now sitting in that position of minister, yeah. you now start distributing it in a way that becomes sort of like reckless, in a way that destroys your 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 the, the 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 proper functioning of your society. So there are other African countries which are good examples who were independent long before South Africa, for example, which tell you what was happening. These guys were struggling to organize uh, their governments to pass on proper services down to the lower levels without the need of a, a multinational. So the DRC is a good example. You can't even get into government without a multinational being there. So you might find Mandela is stuck with uh, Anglo-American in terms of the decisions that he must make, right? Yeah. Which is where now the corruption comes. They give him 50 grand, he puts it in his pocket if he was doing that. That 50 grand he puts in his pocket, multinationals now set up like they did at Lonmin without necessarily doing the necessary work on the ground to build the houses, to build the roads for the mine workers, children and their schools. That's what corruption really is. I don't think corruption should be read correctly called Rinki Tari Policeman, where people will be amassing bags and bags of, of money. It's in the decision making. But it's a question of who do you sit there? Who comes and asks for a decision to be made? And the person who will want decisions to be made in their favor are those who already have economic rent in your society. And in any post-colonial society, what you are entering into 
is people who've already made business in that country, whether it's Anglo-American, whether it's the French and the French uh, African countries, whether it is uh, the big mining houses that were here long before these guys were in government. So these guys still have a lot to lose, depending on who's in power. And as such, will use that economic power to sort of like shift decisions in their favor as much as possible. And I think that's where real corruption really exists. What kind of decision will Njave make as a minister? In whose favor and how? And I think the ESCOM story really, if you read it according to, to, to Kaya's Tolle's breakdown over the years, it's, it's a classic example of, of those who were in power delivering code were not happy when things changed and mm. new businesses were given coal uh, or given the contracts to deliver coal to ESCOM. And as such, that brought in this ripple effect of uh, sabotages we are seeing now, uh, of contracts being overinflated so that you benefit a GT's company as opposed to 50 rand. The company is now charging 150 so that GT can take the 100 rand difference. So it's those. That's where corruption happens. I don't think it would have been Mandela would have left with bags of money. But you are stepping into positions of power, but there's people who've got more power underneath. They've got a lot to lose. They've invested before and as such would want decisions to be made to be made in their favor. And as such sort of like squeeze you into certain decisions. Squeeze you into certain decisions. And I think that's how we we, we ended up here. Because even the companies that were here were not necessarily invested in the country as we would have wanted. I think Trawombeki used to say this, that there was so much money leaving the country when he was president from these big multinationals and, and corporates because they were not wanting to invest real infrastructure in the country because they didn't think this project was going to last long. So they were already leaving, right, taking their assets out and not leaving real infrastructure in the country. And as such, this meant that you couldn't, a, a, a build the way you wanted to build even if, if, if you were president and you are relying on black people who f- couldn't even own property until 94 which is just an, a mess so now you must deal with these guys the way they decide to use it uh, mm. the development of Hamulech is not in direct proportion with whatever they've amassed up to the point of 1994 and this mm-hmm. so it's, it's, it's where corruption <laughs> will, will operate. I don't think yeah. it's so much that, that these guys, I don't even think they will die with that much money because what Fanon also covers is that what they will do is that they will enjoy the opulence of their colonial countries. So the swag, whether it is uh, Louis Vuitton, whether it is Chanel number no. 5, they now use even that money just for the aesthetic look of looking like uh, they are in Heathrow, London, mm-hmm. where they, they've got all these money. So they spend their money recklessly as well as a function of trying to, to, to match the, 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 the opulence that you would see in France. So would you say that during Mandela's tenure as a president of the Republic, there was was he corrupt? So, here's a good example, right? The finance minister of South Africa in 1994, Derek Keyes, that's the finance minister in 1994. This is when you know you're not necessarily in the power that you think you're in just because you're president. So, this guy's finance minister, ne? Mm-hmm. for six months into Mandela's tenure. In that six months, and you can... Find this on Sizum Pofuwalsu's book, uh, The New Apartheid, right? Yeah. Um, so in, the, in that six months, this guy decides to take a decision as finance minister to say that some of these state-owned entities, some of these private companies can unbundle their assets and throw them out into the international space. That's a decision that he takes. One of them was Anglo-American. Right. What does that mean? So they can allow international companies to have ownership of these parastatals? Of the parastatals, right. but also some of the private companies that are in South Africa can now leave. Because remember, South oh. Africa was also closed. Oh, uh, so you, you couldn't sell off your company out of the country at the time? Yes, yes. Okay. 
in that six months, he's the finance minister, right? Mm. Mind you, Mandela doesn't come in with a full-on cabinet. He's, there's mm. the sunset clause made by Joe Slovo, which essentially says, these white guys must not leave. They must stay in government because we don't know what governance is. I mean, that already tells you what's going to happen because these guys have been in there. They are not as welcoming of, of, of the new state. I mean, it's only 63, I think 68% that signed the, 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 oh, uh, the referendum. Yes. Yeah. Only 63% is saying, let's kill this apartheid thing. So there's the people who are against this thing. So Derek Keyes, finance minister, 1994, mm-hmm. first few months, first six to three to six months. His big deals is that he enables ownership parastatals to be unbundled. He also allows some of the private entities to now sell off their shares. Six months. This guy resigns after six months. And as soon as he resigns, he says he's going back to chill with his family. Mm. Three weeks later, this guy is the board chairperson of, uh, he's the, the executive director at Anglo American. Damn. That's just the one thing. This, oh. is in, this is in Mandela's time. Now everybody wants to eat in a lot of ways. Mm. Even the Afrikaners. Mm. Because they are also not sure about this project, yeah, mm. Mandela. So they are also siphoning their own funds in the corners. So as much as they may be attracting investment into the country, right, it's not an investment that's coming in to necessarily be a building in the way that it should. Because I know the stories of Mandela calling people personally, like Oprah, hey man, please, me and you have spoken, please do something in my country, using his charisma. The, The country was not this big thing that Mandela was in charge of in terms of governance because there were these other things that were coming under. But these guys were coming under it, right? So you can go to different government departments to mm. this day. Mm. Some of the government officials who were in charge, Africans government officials, decided to say, okay, no, we need to make sure that we are not replaceable. Mm. So they left with some of the intellectual property that they had built over the years. For example, mm. the the lines of dams and the construction that lie in terms of, let's say, piping under a municipality. So they had probably designed it as government officials. Remember, government was very much a, a, a big employer during apartheid. Yeah. So now this rainbow country is changing. What they decided to do is <laughs> we need to find a way to make sure that we are irreplaceable. So they take that intellectual property and go out and create consultation firms and go out and create small businesses. And then when government now wants to develop, it must now ask itself, I mean, this is classic corruption. They must ask itself, who can we go to? Now they must go to a Fantonder's consultation firm to be able to now understand the infrastructure that lies under, let's say, a a, a, a Spiritoria, for example. And now this guy, because he knows there's nowhere else these guys are going to get this infrastructure and this intellectual property, he's taken it out of the government. So they left government ne? Yeah. and yeah. now became consultants to government. Yeah. And then as consultants to government, because they've got the government by the balls, so to speak, in terms of what the government would need in order to design and create certain things, these consultation firms start charging government exorbitant prices. Yeah. These exorbitant prices means that a lot of the money is now going back to whoever's got the IP to yeah. be able to understand what is happening in a society. So don't just think of piping. Think of other things that a, a government system might need, which was not there b- before Mandela comes in. Yeah. So now, this now corruption. It's not just these ANC guys, but it's the nature of a society that's coming from a colonial experience moving into what looks like a post-colonial society, right? Everybody now is trying to eat as much as possible. Even though we might have a rainbow, it's because this rainbow, we are all not in agreement that this is going to work, so people are trying to find corners for themselves. The Derek Keys is an example. Uh, these guys who decided to create consultation firms, which is why I'm so cynical about the motives at the time. But even if there was international uh, investment coming in from outside, what was true about the time was that the Cold War between Russia and America 
the Belgian war, wall had just fallen. The, the Berlin Wall had just Berlin fallen. Wall, yeah. So there was a big free market interest from the Americans to ensure that they also find space in that country. So this investment that's coming is not so much investment for the development of your own society. Again, it's the, these guys' interest to come and take the money that they can take. And because you don't have a national consciousness about this is the kind of society that we want, or that national consciousness that has been created, nobody, we're not in full agreement. No, not right? everyone buys into it, yeah. Not everyone buys into it. It's yeah. easy for them to even come in from outside. Okay. Then that's where they start uh, eating. And you step, you take it a step further, you talk about now the creation of, of, of BE as an idea, right? Where the likes of Cyril Ramaphosa now start getting corners inside some of these businesses. It's to also quiet their They give them a 10% of APSA. He hasn't worked. (laughs) He doesn't contribute. He says nothing in the board meetings, but he's there as the face. Mm. He then continues to be this thing that makes Sakima Chozoma, Tokyo Sihwale, Selo Ramaphosa, become billionaires of no real... Yeah. But the truth is, the apartheid government took care of its people. I think Ramaphosa was at the Black uh, Business Summit, and people were laughing about what he said. But what he said is that he got a call from from, from Natim Teto, the oh, yes. Teto, yeah. minister, and he says, "I'm Teto. I'm at a cabinet meeting. Mm. I'll call you later." Yeah. And then Ramaphosa says he then called Natim Teto and then says, Natim Teto saying, hey, the people are not happy about this project. What must I do? Ramaphosa then says he told uh, Natim Teto to scrap it. My interest is, okay, why wasn't Natim Teto in the cabinet meeting? <laughs> yes, because he's... Why minister, wasn't yes. uh, Natim Teto in the cabinet? Maybe he might have went to attend to something else. But my concern... He was at Penny Libyan's house drinking tea. <laughs> <laughs> he was with what? Was so that Penny Libyan's house drinking tea? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what he was doing. <laughs> I think that's what he was busy. He couldn't, he couldn't probably. make it. He couldn't make it to the meeting. <laughs> probably, probably he was at Penny's house. What a nonsense! But but at the at the very same breath, I'm just, I'm just like this doesn't make sense that Ramaphosa comes and say no, um, actually cancel this entire project. He knew about this project prior to this entire thing, uh, to Natim Tetua announcing this thing to the public and everybody else. He did not know that this is actually nonsense. How are we spending so much money on a flag, knowing that we have other issues as as, as a government? Like, is it making sense that he goes to the cabinet meetings, he makes it a joke because he was laughing about it, that, no, comrade, cancel that thing. But I'm like... How it it doesn't add up to me if ever. But you know that man is always shocked by everything. You know I was I was he, he I was made... surprised to hear. So sorry to interject them. Man, they have already they have already you know they haven't started building it, ne? Mm. But they've already spent I think a million or two each I can't remember on they call it. Is the way that? But it's literally just brainstorming. Is it a feasibility study? <laughs> yeah, feasibility study and cause, but mm. a couple of millions out of that twenty two. They already have spent some, and there's not even a foundation yet of the flag. You guys know where this thing is going to be yet? Yeah, where is uh, it? It's where is Freedom it? Park. So I don't know if you guys have been to Freedom Park in Pretoria. Uh uh-uh. uh. No, I have uh, this is this is why this flag project makes no sense in this country. You guys, mm. so Freedom Park is this monument. It's a heritage mm. site. They've tried to break down some of the issues that have happened in South Africa. In real terms, if we were a real country that's run on a national consciousness, this is a place where every child must have gone by the time they matriculate. Ideally, that's how you would want it to work, right? Ensure that people can at least see some elements of it. So it's a place where they're trying to bring out what happened during apartheid, how did our country heal. So they built a monument out of the TRC. It's a museum of some kind. Yeah, it's a museum of sorts, a heritage site. So that's where they want to then implement it. Funny enough, where it is, Freedom Park where it is, it's like here, né? on the right. And on the left, there's four tracker uh, a monument, the one that the uh, Afrikaner. Yeah. So it's, this flag <laughs> was going to be sitting right next to the fourth tracker 
150 uh, meter pole overwhelming <laughs> the fourth <laughs> record here. <laughs> so it's going to be quite interesting how they're going to sort it out. But that's yeah, where it was. No, way it was actually. That's a good question. I didn't know where this thing was going to be. It's just thanks to the influencers. He said the only reason that Tim Tetu was stopping is because Bonang said something. He doesn't want to be on the bad side of Bonang. What about that? Three million going to Michal Imchan. What if it's going to Michal? It's probably going to Michal, my dog. It's probably going to Michal or it's going to one of those girls there. So, hey, we'll never know. But anyway, I'm saying there's no flag that is going to cost 22 million. I mean, let's be honest about it. Um, they are doing that unless, uh, unless yeah. it has to continue the education at night, GT. Yes, no. flats are cheap in general, <laughs> but this one no, is not man. ordinary flat. You can't, you can't, you can't. This one it takes education during the day <laughs> and it continues it into the night. <laughs> it's not an ordinary flat. You can't like, expect like, it to cost no, man, that's, that's not.